Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are positively through the bye week, and, I, and my back is back. And uh, all the cancellations and postponements of October, we are putting the Maryland Crab Cake Tour together, sponsored by our friends at the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. Uh, we'll be playing on Thursday at Silver Spring Mining Company in Perry Hall. Lots of guests. Rob Santoni is going to join us from Wise Markets. Gary Rissling, former Skipjack, will be there, uh, as well as uh, Councilman David Marks. Then on Friday, we're in Fells Point. We're going to be down at the Chop Tank at the uh, Atlas Group. Uh, Ron Furman, my uh, musician buddy, Eddie Lauer, is going to be dropping by with his guitar. Uh, Merritt Dworkin is going to be joining us. Lots of friends. Uh, Ron Furman talking some old rock and roll as well. But it is Vikings week around here. Uh, my wife's favorite memory of going to the game in the snowstorm eight years ago. I don't think it will be snowing this week. But I watched Kirk Cousins play, and uh, I certainly watched the Ravens uh, get annihilated by the Bengals two weeks ago and then watch the Bengals lose to the Jets. It's a wild, wacky National Football League schedule, and we're into the second half. I'm going to Minnesota right now. Pat Borzi uh, writes about sports and things and life, and actually, this is kind of a cool thing because he's a New Yorker who lives in Minnesota. I got a lot of Minnesota folks uh, that I'm bringing on this week. Um, Pat, you're always a, a great willing foil and guest anytime the Twins or uh, we don't get together with the Vikings very often. How are things in the Twin City? It's good to have you on, man. Thanks, Nestor. Glad to be here. Um, uh, no, you will not be getting snow this weekend. Um, and in fact, it's it's actually quite nice here. It's in the for uh, for the first week in November. It's in the it's in the forties, and uh, uh, no, no, it's not a snowflake in sync. In well, sight, hey man, we've had one snow game here in the history of the franchise. So when I, mean, I was a kid, you know, Colts, I would see pictures of old games. My dad said, oh, yeah. and then in the seventies, I went to a couple of snow games. I was at a snow game against the Patriots in the seventies. So I had attended such events right and i go into pittsburgh for some snow games but you don't get as many global warming's involved you folks that play you know in these crazy places where it's five degrees all winter build domes anyway um so we actually had this snow globe game here eight years ago that yeah. i don't know that it'll ever be replicated you know i mean it's a it's a confluence of, well now they were playing football into january we've added weeks into the season maybe but it was kind of fun and we don't know much about the vikings i mean every four years we get to together but watching them play this week on Sunday night against the Cowboys it looks like a diminished version specifically defensively when you can't defend yourself against a guy who's never played in the league um unzimmer like I would say for the Vikings right yeah um they've been doing some things that you kind of scratch your head and go this is a guy who's been a head coach here for eight years and he's doing things like calling timeouts he doesn't have He's uh, not calling a timeout at the end of the first half when they're trying to scramble and get a playoff. I mean, they got booed off the field uh, Sunday night because uh, of how they mismanaged the time at the end of the first half. Um, there's a lot of conversation here about, about what's wrong and, and, and why they're only three and four when they've been in every game. And pretty much every game that they have has been a one-score game. And, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of people that wanted the coach fired. Monday morning and are probably very surprised that he still has a job. Um, By the way, I, my lasting image of Minnesota, and I've been there many times, and I, I love your place, and you obviously loved it. You you, you moved there. Uh, but And I want to hear that story, but I'll never, oh, yeah. ever forget the night I met Brian Billick, literally the night I met Brian Billick was the night that the Dirty Bird happened and they lost the championship game. It was the last game he was there. And yeah. I covered that game. I actually had tickets in the upper deck. There were Art Mendel seats and I had a press box seat. Um, and I was down in the locker room when all hell broke loose and the 15-1 season went away and like all that. And I'll never forget getting in the car and listening to sports radio in Minnesota, and everybody wanted Denny Green fired. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you're 15 and one. You just lost by, uh, yeah. like, and that was a decision that would sit on the ball, all that stuff, right? Oh, what yeah. was going yeah. on in the aftermath of that? But I'm thinking, oh, yeah. you know, when you don't win Super Bowls, we don't have a lot of fire John Harbaugh around here. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of fire Brian Billick. I mean, the owner was one of the few people that really wanted him fired. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would think when – when there's disappointment, you know what I mean? We've had a couple of parades here, hopefully have more Lamar, all that. But I think there's a different thing in places where, you know, Fran Tarkington is the, you know, you, you know, and the team's always good. The Vikings are always good. That's right. Here's what you got to understand about the way Vikings fans are here. 
and I used to work in Boston too, before the Red Sox started winning world championships after that long, 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 long drought. There's the exact same mindset here. It's been the, the Vikings, as you know, have never won a Super Bowl. They've won four times, lost all four times. Um, there's a sense of, I don't want to say entitlement because that's the wrong word, but there's so much of the, these guys are going to blow it again. And um, folks just are just so frustrated. They just, and every year they start with the, this is going to be the year. This is going to be the year. And then stuff happens and folks just go crazy. It's exactly like Red Sox fans were for all those years when they couldn't beat the Yankees, when they couldn't get to the World Series. Or the Cubs or the Royals. It's, it's actually or, worse. Or, or, or the well, Eagles or, well, I'll tell or you the what, Chiefs. It, you know, it, like, it, it's <laughs> act, no, it, like, listen to me, Lester. It's actually worse than the Cubs because the Cub fans at least could say, well, you know, we're in a historic ballpark. You know, Chicago's a great city. You know, and and it's believe me, have spent having spent enough time in Chicago, have spending eight years in Boston, and then spend what is it, only oh, like eighteen years here, and growing up in New York. Well, the hardest part I can too tell there you, is I can that tell the Packers you. have won, right? That the Packers have had that their oh, yeah. rival has won a lot. And that's interesting too, because the Packers consider the Bears their big rival. No doubt about that, it. But the Vikings fans. You know, every time that Aaron Aaron Rodgers has a great game, every time the Packers pull a game out, Vikings fans are just ripping their hair out because they're like, why can't we get a quarterback like this? Well, which is a great question. And just as, you know, why can't we win a Super Bowl? Why can't we get back to a Super Bowl? Um, and, you know, the Packers have this tradition. And, you know, for 20-something years, I mean, they've, the Packers have had two great quarterbacks in the last 25 years. The Vikings have had two quarterbacks in the last two years, kind of. Yeah. Well, maybe and, not in the last two years, but if you go back and you look at all the different guys that they've cycled through, you know, going all the way back to, you know, Dante Culpepper and now it's Cousins and then all the guys in between. I remember um, losing a game in Minnesota. The last time I saw a game at the Metrodome was it, it was Brett Favre, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. on the Vikings side. That was 12 years ago, I guess, because yeah. everything happens in four-year increments, right? Right. Yeah, and and folks here, I mean, that was supposed to be the time. You know, they had a they had a great team on both sides of the ball. All they needed was a quarterback. And the first year Favre was here was phenomenal. And then you know they go down to New Orleans, and you know what happened there. Um, and then the next year Favre wasn't. He came back. He wasn't as good. He was old. He was beaten up. Um, and then, you know, they've been trying to get back to that level ever since. And you know, a couple of years ago, where they have they had that miracle play. Uh, that gets them, it gets them through the first round of the playoffs. And then they meet Philly and they just get steamrolled. Um, and then folks are still reeling from that. You know, there's this, well, that would have been a home be Super Bowl. year. Yeah. Kind of I, I was there that week yeah. after they lost that game. That was such a hangover. And then the Eagles fans came in and they had a good time. It was a good game. I mean, Philly special, all that. It was oh, a yeah. very memorable Super Bowl. I mean, for me, the, <laughs> I wound up at the Eagles victory party. So like, hey, that was a wild, crazy five degree week in Minnesota. Yeah. But for the fans there, for the lead up, you know, when I'm sitting on going to live there for a week and broadcast there for a week, I'm like, oh, my God, would, this would be glorious. Because my first Super Bowl was the Minnesota Super Bowl in 92 back in the mm -hmm. day that I went yeah. to. So like I, 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 I. There's a part of me that wants the Vikings to win. I, I have a soft spot for the Vikings, you know, and yeah. I guess that's why I ask because Vikings fans are pissed off. There's a lot of angst for being such nice people. Minnesota nice, right? Yeah, this is this is they reserve all the anger for this team. And, uh, you know, now um, and of course, you probably heard the news yesterday that Daniel Hunter, their best pass rusher, is going to be out for the year with the torn with the torn pectoral muscle. So now they've got even more problems. Um it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with that. I mean, their defense has been, you know, they, they get a pretty good pass rush, but their defense has kind of been up and down. They've given up a lot of points, but they've also made a lot of plays. And, uh, you know, their offense, they're, they're kind of struggling. Clint Kubiak, who's Gary Kubiak's kid, who's the offensive coordinator, first-year play caller. He's been getting a lot of heat because it seems like the beginning of the games, when, when they start with the scripted plays, they score. And then – until the very end of the, the half or the or very end of the game, 
you know, they can move the ball, but then in between they struggle. I mean, they have a terrific running back in Cook. They've got a couple of great receivers. They should be able to move the ball better than they better than they do. You know, Cousins, for you know all the criticism that he gets, has actually had a decent year. Um, exactly what what the problem is is really hard to figure out. But they should. The thinking here is that they should be better than they are. Well, certainly what we saw with the Cowboys beating them with a, a quarterback that's never been on the field and said that he felt like he belonged. And I thought, man, eh, Vikings defense made you feel like you belong. I hope they uh, they, yeah. they make Lamar feel like they belong. Pat Borsey's here. Uh, he covers all things. Give everybody your journey because uh, you've been a guest on the show over the last decade on radio. It's the first time in the video era I've had you on. But, uh, you know, all across the country there are displaced humans like you that would have been me moving around the world, writing about sports, covering sports. Uh, I've got, there's a huge fraternity of us, some getting squeezed out on the other side or going to dot coms or going to teams and doing yeah. different things. Um, you are a sports writer, sports writer to some degree. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. If, if, if that's how you want to put it, um, you know, the, the journey is, you know, I almost don't want to call it a journey. It's just kind of a, just kind of a job description. You know, I, I grew up in New York. Um, I wanted to be a, a sports writer from when I was, when I was a kid. You and, and I have uh, that in common. I wanted to be Oscar Madison or John Stedman. Yeah, there you go. There you go. John Stedman was a terrific writer for many, many years in that town. And that's that's a wonderful person to emulate. Uh, or to well, he was be. my mentor, you know, so. Well, uh, well there you go. And, yeah, and, I, and <laughs> an excellent choice. Well done. Um, that's why I'm still here. I was taught well. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was, um, you know, I was uh, a clerk at Newsday when uh, on Long Island, you know, my hometown paper when I was in college at, uh, at Fordham University in New York. Um, and Ford has produced a lot of, of, of a lot of really good journalism people. And Joe Favorito, really- you know Joe. You ever know Joe? Joe? Yeah. Sure. Joe, Joe, I haven't seen Joe in a long time. I hope he's doing well. Yo, Joe's um, doing great, man. I, I ran into him randomly in the Jersey City in the train station, literally randomly in life. But I see him at the Super Bowl and whatnot. But yeah, Fordham's got a you know a huge uh, m- movement in sports in general. A lot of a lot yeah, of sports we, people went to Fordham. We we have we have a lot of guys that are in broadcasting. We have a lot of guys who are in print. Um, in fact, our, our probably our most famous guy, um, well, our most famous broadcaster is, of course, Vin Scully. And on the on the print side, uh, my, my college classmate, uh, who's not a sports writer, but uh, very well accomplished, the late Jim Dwyer, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, columnist for the New York Times. Uh, and for my own, uh, my own little, how I got here, um, pretty easy. I moved around a bit. You know, I worked eight years at the Miami Herald. Then I went to Boston, where I was the Boston correspondent for the Portland Press Herald up in Maine. And that's where I got a, my first taste of all, all four of the major men's pro sports. So I was covering the, uh, the Patriots, the Red Sox, the Celtics, and the Bruins. So I covered the last few years that Bird, McHale, and Parrish were together. I, I covered the Patriots um, in their decline and then in their rise when, when Parcells took over as head coach before Belichick got there. So I was. I was kind of among the many people that were chronicling their their rise to uh, their rise to prominence under under Bill Parcells. And the Red um, Sox meant everything and could do nothing. Literally. And you know, here, here's the thing: it's really funny. If you want to talk about my my career project trajectory, and I ended up, you know, I worked for the New York Star Ledger. I, I covered the uh, the Yankees and the Mets and the, did the Olympics for uh, did a bunch of different things for them over six years. And then I met this wonderful woman who writes for the Minneapolis Star Tribune named Rachel Blount. And we decided we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And uh, so I quit my job and I moved here and I've been freelancing uh, ever since. And Rach is, uh, Rach is about to cover her 13th Olympics, which would be one more than Bob Costas, something I'm very, very proud to say. <laughs> She'll never tell you that, but I will. And well, I got to have her on to talk Olympics then one time. So for absolutely, sure. absolutely. I might be able to negotiate that one for you. Um, you, you know, the Olympics know. are an amazingly elusive thing for me because in all my life, it's the one thing I've never done. I mean, I've covered, I, I, not covered, but I've been to World Cups. I've been to bullfights in Madrid. I, You know, I, I, I'm that guy. I've never been yeah. to a rugby match or like Aussie football, but I've been to, I've been all over the world doing stuff. I, I always wanted to go to Wimbledon, never made it, but I went to the French and I've been to the U.S. I, so I've, 
I don't really have a bu- my bucket list. There's one thing left on my bucket list is to see the Northern Lights at some point. But other than that, like the sports things I haven't seen. But the Olympics is one of those things that's so filthy to me and sort of politically dirty. Even the World Cup. We're trying to get World Cup games here in 26, right? Yeah. Um, just how the, the, the political side of what happens in Athens and Rio in the aftermath of all of this. And I've been to a lot of places – I was in Beijing before the Olympics with Ripken doing like a whole media thing with the government mm-hmm. and all of that. But I've never actually walked into an Olympic event. And I'm a Lake Placid and a Nadia Comaneci 70s. And certainly right. I would tell anybody I've interviewed. This is my 30th anniversary next month. Mary Lou Retton might have been the favorite thing I've ever done, ever, ever, ever in radio. She sat for 12 minutes and had ice cream with me at the Super Bowl in Houston a few years ago. So I I love the Olympics in that way, but it's one of those things that I had a chance to go to Atlanta in 96. My buddy called me at the end. There were always rooms available. And this is one he's like, hey, I'm flying down. It's $59. You want to go? This is 1996. And the bomb went off the weekend I would have been sort of there doing something or whatever and i didn't have a whole lot of money they it was one of those nah and then after since then i've never even considered it so people that have covered the olympics it's almost like talking to astronauts to me for a little you know to some degree you know yeah well, i i've covered two myself i covered uh uh the Nagano winter olympics in 98 where, where i met my wife and uh, the sydney olympics in 2000 and i can tell you that i mean you're right about uh everything that's going on with the international Olympic committee and, and, and the back and forth. And there's, there's the stuff that you really go, you know, this is, there's a whole bunch of stuff around the political, the po- politics of the Olympics that are just really not good. But when you're standing in a, in a Sydney Olympic stadium and, and Kathy Freeman is coming around the final turn um, in the 800 meters and the entire stadium is standing and cheering for one of your countrymen who's about to do something incredible there's a rush that comes over you that, you know, I've covered nine World Series and, and three Super Bowls and a bunch of other really cool things. And there's a rush that comes over you at that moment that I've never experienced in any in any other sporting event that I've been to. I missed – you know what? He went to Atlanta. He went to the Michael Johnson. Does that sound right? Is it the gold shoes? Wasn't that Atlanta 96? That sounds I, my, right, My yeah. buddy went to that event and said – and my buddy is like – an accomplished human. He's been all over the world, Springsteen, concerts, yeah. things. He would still tell you it was a top fiver. So he always says to me, you should have done that. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't – I was at the Lay Ritz home run as an example. I, I think I was I've there, covered – I was I, there, I covered I was there too. 90 World Series games in my life. Yeah. I've been to 90 games. I was trying to do the math the other day on – even in 1979 with my dad and 83 when I was a kid, I went to the 86 World Series, um, the, the Shea, the Red Sox. So I, I've been to some games, but I, I, when I think about the Olympics and thinking about watching Usain Bolt sprint or seeing Ali light the torch, you know, different things like that. Sydney is fascinating because I saw Springsteen in that in that area where they built all of the stadia and yeah, staging and the, events in the olympic park yeah and you, it's, you take the subway 45 minutes out you know of downtown sydney and and there's just this place where they built something that 21 years later they're still using right and, and yeah. then i saw what they were doing in brazil building stadiums in the middle of the rainforest and what they're doing in dubai and it's just gotten off the rails pat right i mean it really has from what what was always political from 1968 and Munich and even back into the 40s and 50s with Hitler, right? But I, I, where this has gone with kings and sultans and money and displacing people and people dying, building these things, that that's the, the dirty part of it that – it, it, it has to be talked about in addition to Usain Bolt, Michael Johnson, and Kathy Freeman, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, you're, they're about to hold the Winter Olympics in Beijing in a country that has uh, as, as horrible a human rights reputation as any country that's ever been around. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're picking sites. I've always been among the, among the people, and there are more and more of us that uh, simply just pick four sites. And, and just rotate them among these four sites, you know, in, per, in perpetuity, because it costs so much money to build these facilities. And in a lot of countries, like you mentioned in Brazil, they don't get used, you know, once, once the Olympics are over, you know, you can, 
you know, and we, and we can debate. Well, I saw the Athens yeah. stuff where they built baseball, a baseball stadium that had like dog weed growing through it, right? Uh, you know, yeah. years later, because right. what do they need it for? <clears throat> right, because I mean, they play a little baseball over there, but it's not like here. Uh, they spend a lot of money on facilities that don't get used, and and, and why should why should every city that wants to build an Olympics put themselves in hock? just to build a bunch of facilities you're going to use for three weeks. It just doesn't make any sense. And, 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 and you've got some great cities that already have terrific facilities. And we could sit here and debate which four cities you should do it in. Um, you know, for, but the fact is, um, there are so few cities now that want to host an Olympics that the International Olympic Committee is now awarding them to places that probably shouldn't get them. Um, you know, Norway pulled out of the bid for uh, pulled out of a Winter Olympics bid because of the requirements that the IOC has that, that every host country has to do during the Olympics, including every major IOC official has to be greeted at the airport by the highest head of by the head of state. And there are specific requirements that you have to have in place when this person lands. Uh, and including things like you have to have, you know, that always have to be put up in a five-star hotel and all this ridiculous stuff as if it was a reigning monarch that was coming and not the IOC president. It's this kind of stuff that is, is making countries go, we don't want any part of this. This is lunacy. Well, it's a mafia. It's not a sporting event. Right? It, it, it becomes that. Pat Borsi's our guest. We were talking all things Minnesota. Yeah, When we talk about stadia and places that do it right and do it wrong and we brought Sydney into this, you're in the Twin Cities. That's a fascinating story there. I mean, every one of these municipalities, especially now that the the owners got together last week and Stan Kroenke's rolled on the rest of the guys and St. Louis and L.A. and what's going to become of the Chargers and the Jaguars in the end, what cities in Europe they're going to play in, probably London and Frankfurt before it's all over with because the league is so hungry for money. The Vikings... And to, to some degree, the birth of the Timberwolves and what became of the North Stars and now the Wild. Minnesota's had a very sort of slippery path with all of this since taking the Senators and, you know, putting the Vikings, whether it was the, the Met Stadium that became a mall and then the Metrodome wasn't good enough and the Vikings were in peril and they wind up building two really good facilities in your target field. I've been to every stadium except the one in Atlanta um, uh, because it's new, but I've been to all the rest of the baseball stadiums. I did a baseball tour in 15. I did 30 ballparks in 30 days. I love target field. I, I haven't been back. I was back in winter and there wasn't a game going on a couple of years ago during the world series. Yeah. But I would tell anybody if they want to experience a baseball game, go in. And I think your football stadium of all of them, because the Stones were playing all these places, and I was just talking about a friend of mine's a Stones fan said, what about this, what about that? I'm like, well, you know, the Atlanta stadium's like all the other domes, but the Minnesota one's kind of cool and kind of different, and if you want a different vibe, go to the Twin Cities. And certainly bringing politics into this and what happened uh, last year and George Floyd, and, and we've had Freddie Gray in our city. Um, you know, Minnesota took on a whole different light last year, but from a sports community a rich heritage you've moved there with your wife which is a beautiful story but you moved to a place where there's like sports matters i mean not just big 10 and minnesota and they have their own stadium and whatnot but it's there's a very vibrant thing there because sports has been important the last 50 years there right yeah and and let's not also presume that, that everybody here was, was was waving the pom-poms to get all these stadiums built the twins took a long time to get the, the bill for target field passed through the legislature and it only got passed because they finally figured out that they were going to get contracted, the, right? Well, that was that was the threat. Um, there were a whole bunch of other threats. They were going to first they were going to move to North Carolina, and it turns out that the guy that they were going to sell it to didn't have any money, and that really soured a lot of people here on on helping the twins. And what they were finally able to do with the with the the target field bill in the state legislature is they figured out a way where the outstate counties there's like nine nine metro in the metro area, there's like not, there's like a nine county area. Like Hennepin, figured, I know those names, right? Yeah, Hen Hennepin and all, and Hennepin and Ramsey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what they figured out in the bill is that as long as the outstate counties didn't have to pay for it, they'd vote for it. So the uh, uh, one of the tax increments that was passed only affects the metropolitan area. So if you live in 
Eveleth, Minnesota, if you live in Duluth, Minnesota, if you live in Moorhead, Minnesota, any place other than the greater Twin Cities area, you did not get any, ta- you didn't have to pay any tax money towards the stadium. And everybody was like, cool. And so they voted it in. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the Viking Stadium um, was an even harder one to get through in a lot of ways because um, there's a, a Minneapolis City Charter. Uh, in the charter, it says that you can't build another stadium without uh, a referendum in the city. And if they and, and this, uh, the legislation that they passed somehow circumvented that if they had this had gone to a referendum because people didn't want to vote for the stadium. If this had gone to a referendum, it would have been voted down and the Vikings would still be playing in the Metrodome or it might be playing in another city. There was a lot of back and forth of whether or not the threat to move was legitimate at the time. But as we've seen, you know, the L.A. area built a new stadium uh, now for the uh, you know, for the Rams and the Chargers. So maybe there would have been something there. Um, what's interesting now is that in Minneapolis, um, now that you have uh, Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez who bought the Timberwolves and they're talking about a new facility, there is no appetite in Minneapolis for building a new facility. Now in St. Paul, they built a stadium for the soccer team, uh, Minnesota United. And I'm um, seeing that happening everywhere. A little so- There's a little soccer uh, stadium going up in St. Louis. I was in St. Louis seeing the yeah. Stones a couple weeks ago and, and you know, seeing the aftermath of when you get your team taken away, right? Minnesota's had all the threats in the world, right? Other than the Lakers, <laughs> right? But I yeah. mean, uh, but it, in modern days, they've gotten it done because it's been important there. Yeah, yeah, they've, they've managed, managed to get it done. But like I'm saying, there's now a bit of stadium fatigue here. And it's going to be very, I'm very curious to see how, uh, Lori and A-Rod are going to get a new facility because Target Center was where they played was just renovated and it was a very expensive renovation, a multi-million dollar renovation. It's still, it's better than it was, but it's still not as state of the art as a lot of the newer facilities around the NBA. And you know how this works. As soon as, as soon as Jerry Jones built his stadium down in Arlington, everybody wanted one of those. Um, every, every other NFL owner wanted one of those. Um, as soon as you get a couple of newer facilities built in the NBA, everybody wants one of those. Um, and it's the same in baseball. I mean, once, once, uh, uh, Camden yards got built and everybody wanted their own Camden yards and that's how target field ended up happening. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not, uh, they're going to get any public money to build a new basketball arena. Um, and by the way, the hockey arena over in St. Paul that got built, it's only 20 years old, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's still one of the premier facilities in the NHL. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Timberwolves, I've said this for years, I wouldn't be surprised if the Timberwolves end up playing over there at some point, either temporarily or maybe permanently. Pat Borzi is joining us from the Twin Cities. The Vikings are in town this week. The Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by our friends at the Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. We're going to be back uh, out on the road this week. Silver Spring Mining on Thursday. Friday, we're at the uh, Chop Tank in Fells Point. Then next week, Fadley's on Wednesday. Nick's Grandstand Grill in Timonium on Friday. And then on the 17th with our mayor, Brandon Scott, at Coco. So a lot of crab cakes uh, coming in here. So uh, from the Vikings' perspective and your football wisdom here, this This Lamar Jackson thing, when I talk to people like you in places that only see us every four years and watch Lamar from afar in another conference or whatever, this is one of the more interesting experiments uh, on the landscape of sport. And every time I watch baseball, I see the whole sport has moved and shifted and analytics and all of that. But running this offense for the Ravens, uh, it's been a wild experiment, the revolution of John Harbaugh four years ago, and that... It's working. It's still, especially if you're the Vikings and you're Zimmer and you got to figure this defensive thing out where you're already having some problems chasing Lamar around and it becomes a real challenge for teams that don't ever see this. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see how they're going to defend this guy. Um, because again, you know, to me, the, the best way you defend a guy like that is to just pressure him, you know. Um, but now their best pass rusher is out for the year. Um, Everson Griffin who they brought back this year has been playing more than they probably expected because um, he's been playing really, really well. And uh, you know, if, if you, if you don't, if you don't contain Jackson, 
Um, you guys can put up – the Ravens can put up a lot of points in a hurry, and they're going to be big problems. And, uh, you know, he's already – you know, Zimmer is already I – mean, Zimmer being a defensive guy is already uh, is already in a tough spot here. And if, if anything less than a terrific performance, and um, he's going to really be in some trouble. Still a baseball guy? I mean, you, you spent oh, a, lot, a lot of yeah, nights fact, up lately with the Yankees, right? Yeah, yeah. And, in, in fact, I was, I was kind of – I had I had Sunday off, so I was switching between the World Series game and the uh, uh, and and the Vikings game as I was uh, I was sitting here in the South Minneapolis bureau, as it were. Have, have um, you enjoyed this? I mean, it, not even to who's going to win, or because it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I it, I the, the Astros are cheaters, and I and I hate cheaters, but I don't have a good cop, bad cop. I mean, my team loses 107 games every year, and we're trying to keep the team out of Nashville. You know what I mean? Yeah, like we I have understand. a whole different thing going on here with baseball. I feel I, I feel for you man that's a, that's a rich tradition that you guys had and what's going on there now is not good it's an amazing thing watching Daniel Snyder and watching these owners not roll on to him and knowing what Angelos would have would have piece of filth he's been for 30 years and we've been subjected to it no one in major league baseball and the nationals exist and like and what's happened to my city you know my city of ruins downtown on summer nights with 3,800 people coming to baseball it's insane right so and I'm in the middle of all and I'm the bad guy for like pointing a light on it right here but I but no one cares anymore about baseball here and the really weird part is and and I have Luke on all the time who covers it, still goes down there 60, 70 nights a year, sits in our press box seat, you know, the whole deal. And I, my last name's Aparicio. You know, the reason I exist and live and I'm here is because Louie brought my my father over in 1964, and that's why I, I'm, I'm breathing, right? So baseball is a big part of my life. I, I did the tour in 15, and since then – I don't watch a lot of baseball. I'm not proud of that. I'm not bragging about it. No one else, no one I know watches a whole lot of baseball here. And then when I put it on, when I helicopter in in October, and I've been on my ass, Pat. I hurt my back. You know, I, I like most of October, I've really been hurting and laying down. And now you have all these games on 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock. The Dodgers and the Giants are on all night. Yeah. And I just – What's the old Barry Manilow song? I've looked up, down, trying to get that feeling again. And I, I, I watch these shifts, the players, starting pitchers leaving with two outs in the first inning. Like, it's just, it, it's just not recognizable to me. And yeah. I see Nasty Jack on talking about 91 and the Metrodome and Game 7. And, and I have all of our people on, you know, people that wrote books you know, about the, those World Series and stuff. I, they're great friends of mine, and, and I love baseball, and I like talking about baseball. But when it comes to you and me talking about Game 4 the other night and, like, sitting here, like, the way I did for the first 20 years of my career, it's just over in that way. And these shifts and four-and-a-half-hour games, I can't stay awake for it. And I'm And it's not because I go to bed early. I just... I don't find it compelling. I mean, I find it like a band that I used to like, and I don't love the songs anymore. And it's just like I don't need to listen to that anymore. I can listen to Zeppelin instead. I can watch football. I can read a book. I can do something else. Here's – you're touching on something that I've been railing about for, for several years now. What baseball has allowed itself to do in little increments is it's allowed its game – a lot of different things to filter in to become and to become unwatchable to a lot of people, to guys like you and me who grew up with a certain kind of baseball. Now, I don't want to be this grouchy old man, get off my lawn, and but it's it, everything was better and when I was a kid. Are. And it would be okay if the kids were digging it. They're not. They think it well, sucks too. Well, and because it's not interesting. You know, what's inter- what makes an interesting baseball game? Stealing bases, a terrific defensive play. Uh you know, a big rally, you know, two of the three things that, that really make baseball exciting aren't done anymore. Action. And and, and yeah. And there's, this all started, give me about 90 seconds to do this. You have all the time you want. That's what we do here. Okay. Um, This all started in the nineties between the Yankees and the Orioles when teams started, you know, they started playing the four hour games. And what was happening is that, figured out the really good hitting teams figured out that they wanted to get the starting pitchers out of games. So they're taking a lot of pitches. They're taking a lot of close pitches 
And the point was to get a guy to throw a hundred and something pitches in five innings, get him out of the game, get to the bullpen. Cause at that time, the first two guys that they brought out of the bullpen were probably not very good because they that's were why failed they were starters were, yeah, exactly. and failed closers. And, and that was, you know, that was a great strategy, but then other little things began happening. And then that made games longer. The thing that makes games longer, and there are a lot of things that do it, but the one thing more than anything is you look at total pitches games today. Guys are throwing, teams are throwing about 100 more pitches than they used to throw in, like, 1988. And you can see it right in the box scores. And if you add 20 seconds or even 25 seconds for every pitch, that all adds up. Now, there it was a bunch amazing. Of other- Pat, but when Jerry Remy died this week, and I thought about being a boy yeah. and seeing Jerry Remy in a Red Sox uniform in 1979 when I was down mm-hmm. underneath the stadium, when Kiko Garcia had a home run, and I got to go to the hit and run bird feed room. Uh, as a junior Oriole winner, I was 11. Um, so I, I thought about Remy, and I thought, he didn't play with Louie. And I remember the first baseball game I ever went to, and I thought, Remy was a, was an angel, and I had to, I could look him up. You know what I mean? Like, I was getting my old baseball card mind going from the early 70s. Yeah. And I it reminded me of the first baseball game that I ever went to. Louis Aparicio was a Red Sox in 1973. And I didn't realize the Red Sox were good. They won 89. I thought they stunk. They didn't. 75 wasn't an aberration. They were working into that with yeah, they, Yaz and – they started getting they started getting better in the early seventies. They had some nice teams, you know, with the uh, I remember them, you know, they they won a pennant in sixty seven and a couple of those guys were still around. Yeah, Tion, like Fisk, I mean all of that, right? I mean Cepeda was coming in, Oglavy, they had Burleson, they had players, not just Lynn and Rice, but so seventy three was the first time I went to a game and I went to baseball reference and it was September eighth and ninth. It was a two game Red Sox series. I have a picture of me and Louie you know, underneath the stadium from that, you know, literally I'm four and a half years old. You can yeah. like, so I looked up the box scores just to see who was playing, you know, Rick Harper and you know, whoever, right. Who was playing second base for the Red Sox at that point. Well, Tommy, Har- Tommy Harper, you probably mean. Tommy Harper, I, 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 Rick Miller, Tommy Harper. Yeah, there you me, go. My bad. Um, so anyway, I, I looked up the, there was a game that was nine to four, you know, um, 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 Marty Patton started it. They, you know, there were 22 hits in the game, two hours and 38 minutes. Two hours yeah. and 38 minutes, and <laughs> there were 13 runs and 22 hits. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, my God. You, you know, I just looked at it. There haven't been a two-hour, 38-minute game in baseball in 20 years. It, it's hard. <laughs> and, you know, and part of it, too, is the, the, the breaks between every half inning used to be one minute. Now they're like two minutes and 30-something seconds. Um, I don't yeah, mind yeah. that when I go get a hot. I, I don't mind any of that. What I mind is when I sit down and watch the game, I'm checking my phone. I'm blowing my nose. I'm grabbing a sandwich. I'm surfing to something else. My mind's over here. Because staying with it, I don't know. It just sort of becomes a book that you're on page 15, and you're like, do I want to finish it? And, yeah. do, and do I have the belly to still be here at 1048 tonight to see the ninth inning of this 14 pitchers later? Like, it's just – I don't know, man. I, 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 I don't have anyone I know, and I like I've known Rosenthal my whole life. That if I really sat here with Ken on the second beer and said, "Dude, like, do you really like? Like, you're watching this. Is this really better? Is it more compelling? Is it more interesting? Is it more exciting? Is it better for storytelling? I don't know. But I, I, and it's not Buck or Smoltz. It's not the broadcasters. I don't know. And it's not not knowing the history of the game. I've dedicated my whole life to it. Oh, yeah. It's just this fly into like, do I care about Freddie Freeman or do I not? Yeah, there. You know, we could probably take up an entire show and maybe an entire month of shows talking about how baseball has lost its way. And it's, it's not a compelling game anymore for young people. Um, it's, it's certainly, uh, there are a million things that baseball has done wrong in the pursuit of revenue that uh, has put it in this precarious position. And uh, on top of everything else, there may be a lockout December 1st. Yeah, I haven't even brought that up. I don't, dude, I covered that like oil. I mean, like seriously, I was on that because of the strike in 94. I learned that stuff with my dad canceled the sporting news in 81. And I spent 30 years on the radio here. And the first 10, it was labor with, with baseball. And to think that I have to relearn that this off season to figure out what the hell they're fighting about now. Like, uh, it, it, 
they, they should really be fighting to fix their product. And, and I don't think they think anything's wrong. That's the that's sort of the worst part of it is the more I watch it, the more it's like nothing's wrong here. There's nothing to see. And they'll continue to think that as long as people continue to pay exorbitant ticket prices and go to the games. But I'll tell you what, there are markets where you can't watch a game on television. There are markets where people are just are not going to games or they're only going once a year. Um, and there are markets where uh, fans, here's, a th- here's what I see in Minnesota a lot. Okay. You go and to a, a good Twins baseball game. town. You would say it, right? it's a good baseball town. Yeah. yeah. It's, you go to a Twins game and you see tons of people wearing jerseys of players who are no longer Twins. And the reason is because the jerseys are expensive. You can't, you can't drop 150 bucks every two years on a new jersey for your new favorite player. But folks, their folks don't stay long enough for fans. I would to get, get a Carew jersey, them. 78 powder blue, done, over with. Yeah, and there just you go. It. Yeah, and there are there are folks that do that. There are plenty of people who bought Joe Mauer jerseys when Joe was uh, when Joe was at the height of his career that will continue to wear them for probably another 20 years. Um, I see all kinds of jerseys, but I don't see very many jerseys of the current players. And uh, that's a problem. I can't tell you that that's the case in a lot of other cities, but I can tell you that it, folks, when, when you have fans that can't get attached to players because they're so, I've never been, there's never been a time in baseball where players are more disposable to owners and general managers well, they don't and even really want stars, stars starting now. pitchers because they don't want to pay them. Yeah. Well, right? nobody I mean, wants to pay. The only, the only guys that are going to get their money, and this has been kind of a, a growing thing over the last 30 years, the only people who get paid now are superstars. Eddie Rosario was a, was a twin, came up through the farm system, played really hard, played hurt, did everything you want, want for a guy. They didn't want to go to arbitration with him and have to pay him $12 million, so they let him go. Nobody else signed him in the offseason. He ended up going to Cleveland on a minor league contract. Uh, so he's making like $8 million and you see what he's doing in postseason. He's great. Um, that's the thing. Guys like him, f- even 15 years ago, would have got a three-year contract from their original team. Now, nobody wants to sign guys like this. He's a good player. Um, and there are plenty of good players that don't get signed. If you were a first baseman 20 years ago and hit 20 home runs, you'd get a three-year contract. You'd stay. Now, everybody's grandmother hits 20 home runs. So these well, we guys got the Trey wrong. Mancini thing going on here, the wasted money on Chris Davis. And in yeah. our franchise, they, you know, they'll talk about Rutschman and all that, but Manny Machado, you know, they drafted and brought him in here and never even thought about keeping him. Like, just it, it, it didn't even occur to them. And he's a bit of a turd of a human being, uh, you know, as well. You don't want to invest for you. But, but when you lose 107 games, when your strategy is we're going to serve lousy coffee for five years in the hopes that maybe one day the cup will be drinkable – it's I don't know baseball's lost its way in that way for me here in Baltimore just seeing how the community's been shat upon for three decades and no one in New York even acknowledges that things are even a problem here to try to make it better a matter of fact we get punished because the owner's such a creep I mean we had the all-star game we didn't have the all-star game because we lost the all-star game because our owner's a creep and he's suing them all so, you know, we're in the middle, we, we, we are the child in that divorce, and then the Nationals, it, it's even worse in markets where there was a history, and come on, man, you came in here, covered a lot of Yankees, Orioles games back oh, in the yeah. day, ate crab cakes over at Fadley's, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, that, I know. That, this was a serious thing here that they I really, know. really effed up for my, for, for me and my, for the value of my home, they effed it up, you know? That's, uh, and that's really unfortunate. Pat, I love having you on, dude. I'll have you on and yell about baseball and Olympics. So uh, I'm probably going to upgrade next time and have your wife on and, and do some Olympics. But uh, That's uh, always I, an upgrade, and, and that's that's a beautiful thing. She'd be terrific. Hey, man, I, I appreciate the visit with you, and uh, you give me a great, great old foe to argue with about baseball, and uh, next time you're in Crab Cakes on me. And I look forward to get back out to the Twin Cities. I, I almost came out for the Stones a couple weeks ago when I blew my back out. Yeah. Things got a little screwed up, but yeah. um, but Minnesota's on my short list. I mean, my wife still hasn't been to a baseball game there, so uh, at some point, summer night in Minnesota, probably a good place to be, except for the Mosquitoes. Absolutely. Right? 
Cannot be beat. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to seeing you. Thanks for having me on. Always fun. Always a good time. Pat Borsi joining us here. He is at Minnesota. You can follow him out on Twitter and sports writings and the writings of his wife and uh, as well as uh, the Vikings coming in here. Luke is in Owings Mills all week long. We'll have all the press conferences and all that stuff out at WNST. All of it brought to you by our friends at Royal Farms. Real fresh, real fast. Doing the crab cake tour. Getting back out. Eating some turkey. Finding some pumpkin and some eggnog at Wise Markets. We are WNST. AM 1570. Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking. Baltimore. Positive.